Hey guys, this is Andrew with HKN, and today we're going to be talking about one of the first steps in the background information on the optimal receiver, and that is discrete signals. Well, like I said before, we want to be able to represent our continuous time signals in, uh, uh, as symbols, and specifically it would be nice if we can re express these symbols as a finite set of numbers that we can work with called an alphabet. Um, so how would we do that? Well, uh, we can think of representing these maybe as uh, some combination of letters. So say for instance, we look at this guy, um, it looks like pulses of length T. You know, we have T, T to 2T, 2T two to 3T, they're all of length T at different heights A, B, C. So you could kind of think of representing this signal because it's so regularized as uh, maybe like A, B, C as a vector. Um, so that's a good idea. So maybe we should formalize it a little bit. And the way that we're gonna formalize it is we're going to borrow something from uh, vectors in linear algebra. So if you think of, if you remember your linear algebra, um, we had these things called basis, uh, bases, and every vector was given with respect to a basis. So, for instance, you know, we have the R3 basis is uh, 0, 0, 001, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. You can make any vector out of a combination of those, and they span the space. So, and not only that, they're at right angles to each other, which ended up being nice in linear algebra. Um, and they all have unit length. Uh, so that's called orthonormal. So what we're going to do is we're going to borrow from this. And if we're going to do that, what we would do is we can find a basis set of signals. For instance, maybe a pulse of length T, a pulse of length T, a pulse of length T, all shifted in time, and then multiply them by some vector. And we should be able to get back our, uh, our original signal through this multiplication. Then in some sense, if we represent all of our signals in terms of this basis, we can ignore the basis and only work with the vectors that are representing, that are represented uh, times the signal set. But in order to do this, we would have to be able to project our single signals onto these bases. In order to do a projection, you remember that we'll need some formalization of a dot product. So first and foremost, uh, we need to define what an inner or a dot product is for signals. So the dot product of two signals, say, we're going to write this as x of t, y of t, and in angle brackets is going to denote an inner, an inner product or a dot product. Um, that is defined as the integral negative infinity to infinity of x of t times the conjugate of y of t dt. So this will make sense. You're integrating over all values of t. We should just get a number out. And since the inner product is also called a scalar product, it makes sense that we get a number out. Um, so that is the definition. And therefore, we would want to find our object of discretizing these signals is to find a set of vectors um, indexed at uh, by k, let's say k equals one up to capital K uh, of we're going to call the basis set phi sub k of t. So we want to find a set of these functions such that the discrete representation, which we're going to call the S vector, um, equal to S sub 1 to S sub capital K. Um, we want to be able to minimize the error, which is defined as the integral or the, the, discrete, the uh, continuous sum of the difference between the actual signal and the representation from 
all of the from the discrete signals. So that would be uh, SK times phi K of T. We want to integrate this DT. And specifically, we're going to look at the magnitude squared of this difference. Uh, because we don't want to have a kit situation where it overshoots just as much as undershoots. Um, we want a positive difference to be the same as a negative difference. Um, so this is the error function that we're trying to minimize when finding this set of phi k's and s's. And we say that it is, if e equals zero, that defines a complete basis set. So in order for um, these guys to be orthonormal, so when we're defining what orthonormal is, and one thing I'll say before moving on to what orthonormal is, if you notice what this summation is here of sk times phi k, it would actually be if you write phi k as a vector, so say phi 1, phi 2, phi 3 in a vector, it would actually just be the dot product of these two vectors which will come up to be very nice later on. Um, but in order for an ortho something uh, to be orthonormal, you need the dot product of phi k of t and let's say phi j of t. You need that dot product to equal to delta, this would be the Kronecker delta of j minus k, where, del where the Kronecker delta of, say, n is defined as 1 when n equals 0 and 0 otherwise. So basically what that means is this inner product should evaluate to 1 if they're the same function and 0 otherwise. That is the definition of orthonormal functions. And we're looking for a set of these to be orthonormal. Um, the reason that we want them to be normal will come up later, and it becomes very, very useful and makes, uh, and makes our transition between different types of receivers uh, easy and makes the, t the main one that's used possible. If they're not normal, you can't do this. You can't move to what's called the minimum distance receiver. Um, so some useful properties of uh, this kind of discrete representation of signals. So basically if you find SK and Phi K such that this works for all of your signals, um, such that this works for, you know, signal one. So you have one signal here, say you have another signal. Uh, you want this to match for all of them. You want to minimize this for all your signals. Um, what you, some useful um, pro uh, properties of this are that the inner product of your S with itself is equal to the integral over the magnitude squared of S, which is actually just the energy in your signal. And that's very useful. Basically, it says that the magnitude squared of your vector represented in this uh, with respect to this orthonormal basis equaling the dot product of it with itself equaling this integral is indeed just the energy of the signal. The other thing that's useful about this is that it is distance preserving. So basically this is one thing in that, you know, a distance here, the, a magnitude of a vector can be thought of as a distance, and the distance squared is just the energy. Um, the other thing that's nice is that if we look at this, which is defined as some distance between signals, we integrate between them. This is the distance between the signals. So we say if we have, say, SI of t, uh, minus sj of t magnitude squared and we integrate that dt. This is the same as the summation from k equals 1 up to capital K 
of the difference, s, the jth signal with respect to k, the ith signal with respect to k. Um, doesn't matter which way, I guess, because it ends up being a magnitude squared. Um, and if we look at this, uh, this is just a representation of the Euclidean difference squared. So it's just basically the difference um, si vector minus sj vector squared. So the difference between the two signals, or what that kind of distance we were looking to minimize, is actually just the same as the distance between the two vector representations is if you use the same basis set. So to recap, before we end here, um, we specifically defined a dot product between two signals as this integral of x times y conjugate for any x and y. Um, we then said, OK, we want to find, in order to discretize this signal, we're going to think of them as vectors, which are just a discrete set of numbers. Um, and in order to do that, we needed a set of basis functions, which ended up being orthonormal, um, such that it would minimize this cost function. And if the cost function actually ended up being zero when we minimized it, we would say that the basis set is complete. We then define what orthonormal means. An orthonormal means that if uh, you take the inner product of uh, any function with any other function, if the, the other function is not the first function, it should be zero. And if it is the first function, this dot product ends up being just the magnitude squared of the function, which should be one. And that's the normalized property of it. Uh, ni nice and compactly demonstrated by this said delta function here. We then thought of some nice properties, which said that if we have a, uh, a signal here, it preserves the energy. So the magnitude squared of the vector equaling the dot product with itself, equaling the integral over all time of the signal magnitude squared uh, is the energy. These are all equal, so it ends up being very nice to express the energy of a signal just as the magnitude squared of a vector, as long as these are orthonormal. Um, and then finally, we discussed the distance preserving property of this kind of discrete representation, which says that uh, the distance that we defined for our, um, for our cost function as just the distance between two signals being the magnitude squared of the difference integrated over all time, um, can also be written as the summation over the magnitude squared of the difference of each component of the vector, which we know as just the magnitude squared or of the difference between the two vectors or the Euclidean distance between the two vectors. And, that, and these points all come up to be very important later on. So now, um, we know that we can do all this if we express an orthonor as an or uh, using an orthonormal basis set and then project it onto it. Um, but how do we find an orthonormal basis? Well, we're going to discuss that next time. And I uh, hope you guys learned something from this. Uh, and have a good day, guys.